Thank you. Our next item of business is topical questions. And our first question from Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the implications are for its budget of the general election and the postponement of the UK budget. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The general election on the 12th of December has forced us to cancel our plans to publish the Scottish budget on that day. And the uncertainty caused by the postponed UK budget continues indefinitely. I agree with the Finance and Constitution Committee's view that the Scottish budget should optimally be published after the UK budget. And the consequence of this is that the 2020-2021 Scottish budget will not publish before Christmas. I am mindful of the importance of parliamentary scrutiny time around the Scottish budget and will continue to work with the committee to agree a new budget date as soon as possible. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Cabinet Secretary. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that without tax policy announcements of, the, of a UK budget and the tax, social security and economic forecasts produced by the OBR, the Scottish Government simply cannot know how much money is available to spend in 2021? Therefore, can the Cabinet Secretary please tell me what representations have been made to the Tory Government about this very challenging situation? Do they comprehend the scale of the problem? And if so, what response, response has he had? Well, Mr Crawford's uh, analysis is quite right. Without the tax policy announcements of a UK budget and the tax, social security and economic forecast produced by the OBR <coughs> for a UK budget, which determine the block grant adjustments, the Scottish Government simply cannot know how much money is available to spend next year. Without a new date for the UK budget, we don't know when that certainty will come. So I have written uh, to both the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and the Chancellor, prospective Chancellor, uh, earlier this month to express concern and to stress that the UK budget should proceed as soon as possible after the general election, as well as the need for early dialogue and information sharing with the Scottish Government after the election. Now, I have not had a reply to these letters and therefore do not know uh, UK Minister's comprehension of the situation. But I'm sorry to say I fear they aren't too interested in the effective working of devolution or the public services of Scotland. Bruce Crawford. Yeah, I thank again Cabinet Secretary. Can the Cabinet Secretary also confirm there remains the issue of interaction of taxes between the UK Government and the Scottish Government which can, can cause significant difficulties for Scottish tax policy if the UK Government has not set its tax policy first. Does he agree that in order for the Scottish budget to take place in an orderly fashion, it's essential the UK budget takes place as soon as possible after the general election? And what are the consequences for Scottish public services if the UK budget is delayed beyond the very beginning of the calendar year? In, in detail, the UK budget contains a number of important pieces of information uh, for devolution and for the devolved and partially devolved taxes. And without this, it's more difficult for the Scottish Government to set our budget. We don't have the block grant adjustments based on the most up-to-date forecast and the latest UK policy intentions. And of course, let's bear in mind there may be a difference between announced election uh, intentions from prospective UK governments and what actually features in a spending review or indeed uh, a budget. So I do agree that it's essential that the UK budget takes place as soon as possible after the general election. As I've said, I have emphasised that point to the Treasury. I was alerting concerns to the Treasury about other matters. If they want to see devolution working successfully. They have to engage seriously in this and understand our processes as well. But the consequences for the delay to public services are important because that uncertainty continues for local government and public bodies. It both around substantive budgets that they would wish to know and many of course public sector employers would need to consider pay remits and dialogue with trade unions uh, uh, and, and others with effect from the 1st of April. So I will continue to engage with the unions, COSLA and others on the budget process but we do need the UK government to act as quickly as they can post-election. My officials will continue to work with committee clerks and the Scottish Fiscal Commission who have engaged in this matter eh, on contingency options around the budget process and timetable so that we can productively use the time before the UK general election to have us as well placed as possible to respond to different scenarios. But failure of the UK government to engage in this matter is very severe to Scotland's public services. 
Dean Lockhart to be followed by Rudy Grant. Uh, thank you, President Officer. There is uh, a slight hint of hypocrisy in the SNP complaining about a delayed budget, when, after all, they also voted to have an early general election. According to a recent Fraser Valander report, Scottish income tax revenues are on track to disappoint relative to the rest of the UK. And as a result, despite the block grant from Westminster increasing by over 2%, the overall budget available to the Scottish Government will increase by less than 1%. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the Fraser of Allender analysis? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think the important point for the Conservatives to understand is the Tories who have continually proposed, I'm not referring to the general election, but over the course of um, it specifically, but over the course of, of continuous budgets, the Tories have proposed tax cuts for the rich of society, and that would lead to cuts in spending for our public services. Our progressive tax policy has actually raised revenues to be able to invest in our public services. And in terms of cancellation of the UK government's a budget, the UK government could have gone earlier if they so desired. If they wanted, they could have gone earlier. But it would appear that the Prime Minister's track record was that he couldn't get anything through Westminster, never mind the chaos of a budget failing as well. This has been the track record of a UK government that has been incompetent, chaotic, and that may well have led to a chaotic budget process as well. In having a general election, the key point is we are where we are now, but there is nothing to stop the UK government proceeding as quickly as possible, because I understand their budget was all ready. It was good to go, I understand it. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. But if it is the case that any incoming UK government, whoever it may be, should proceed with the budget as quickly as possible so that this parliament can properly consider matters eh, that are devolved to us in setting out our tax and spending uh, proposals and that this parliament can properly scrutinise those proposals as well and it must not be left to the last minute by the UK government with all the negative consequences that that would have for the people of Scotland and that's why I'm encouraging the action uh, that I am for Treasury to take in these circumstances. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Um, councils need to set their budgets and council tax and that's time limited. We're also having new devolved powers over Social Security, which would prevent them being part of a roll-on budget. The Cabinet Secretary talked about scenario planning for different scenarios. When will he share those scenario plans with the Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. Well, again, I'm engaging with the Finance Committee to set out uh, an agreed timetable that can be mutually agreed with Parliament, recognising that we need a, sp a bespoke, and the Finance Committee recognises this as well, a uh, bespoke process that gets us through these unprecedented circumstances. I, I, I share the concern around uh, timely settlements to local government, and I know that I've engaged with opposition spokespeople and I appreciate the consensual approach to that, but there are matters that people need to understand. We don't have a simple mechanism that would allow the rollover from one financial year to the next. Uh, these circumstances were not foreseen by the signatories and, of course, creators of the Scotland Act, Whereas if we do not pass a rate resolution, we raise no income tax. That would be catastrophic to the public services of Scotland. We, of course, need to pass the non-domestic rates uh, resolution and, and, and necessary orders as well. Indeed, the local government financial settlements. So there are many significant matters uh, that cannot be wished away by those that think there's an easy alternative process. So I will present a budget uh, as soon as I possibly can to Parliament in agreement with, uh, hopefully in agreement with the parliamentary authorities and the, the uh, Finance and Constitution Committee as we work within these uh, circumstances. And I said in the medium term financial strategy, the range of determinants that would set out an impact on our fiscal plans, and that's actually come true in terms of the risks and the volatility and the um, variables that we wrestle with. But I'll continue to engage with opposition spokespeople to try and ensure that we have a process that can get us through this in a very effective, consensual and cohesive manner. But whatever we do, and I, I, I call upon all parties in this chamber in these unprecedented circumstances, let's work together to ensure that there is no risk to the revenues and expenditure for our public services. And whatever we do, we work together to address the volatility, uncertainty and chaos that's been foisted upon us by the UK government and work to ensure that devolution can deliver even in these exceptional circumstances. Patrick Harvey. 
If we are uh, still waiting part way through January for a UK budget to be published, what is the last time, the last date on which the, the Scottish Government can make a decision about whether it may need to proceed to attempt to introduce a Scottish budget in the absence of a UK one? And if we are in that scenario of having to, to try to debate a budget without a UK budget in place and potentially with emergency bill procedures, Surely it is just one more example, not only of political contempt from the UK government, but also of a fundamentally dysfunctional fiscal framework which needs to be fundamentally redesigned. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I agree with um, Patrick Harvey's fundamental point there, and it's one that I had already alerted to the Treasury and to the Finance Committee. But even before the cancellation of the UK budget, I was already of the view that with the experience that we now have, that the fiscal framework requires to be urgently reviewed. I was of that view before, but this has proven the case why it needs to be revisited as a matter of urgency. In terms of the circumstances in which if the UK government runs so late in terms of a UK budget, as the Finance Committee, of which Patrick Harvey's a member, if it runs so late as to present the kind of difficulties that I was outlining in an earlier answer, then it isn't impossible that the Scottish Government would proceed before uh, the UK Government's budget. But that would bring considerable, and I, I do think almost unacceptable, risks to the process in terms of trying to arrive at the numbers that we're working with, the tax proposition that we'd be trying to second guess of the UK Government and other matters. And I do think that that would be a risky process. Um, so we will want, uh, we will impress upon the UK Government to set a UK budget and outline their policies as quickly as possible and of course respond to that because that will give us an orderly approach to budget setting uh, in Scotland. But I am so concerned about the risks of us going before the UK government. I know the Finance Committee agree with that risk and will continue to work uh, with opposition spokespeople with a range of contingencies should it transpire that the UK government is going to continue with this uncertainty by not even setting a budget, but not even setting a budget date, which is the position that we're now wrestling with, with the UK government. Thank you. Question number two, Jamie Green. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that NHS staff shortages are putting cancer survival rates at risk. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. I want to start by thanking the cross-party group for their helpful report and the recommendations which fairly set out the key challenges we face and the work we need to do. We've invested £1.6 million in radiotherapy training and staffing to date, meaning in the past two years, we've seen significant increases in patients accessing modern radiotherapy. We've seen the number of consultants with a speciality of clinical radiology working in the health service in Scotland increasing by over 45% since September 20, 2006, and with 290 more training places in place since 2014. Earlier this month, I announced a further 70 additional training places to be recruited in 2020 in key specialism, including radiology and oncology. All of these staff and many others are working hard to deliver the high quality of care our patients need, which produces the 95% uh, of patients rating their overall experience of cancer care positively. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that update and uh, add uh, my thanks to the cross-party group who did an excellent job uh, uh, with this report and the organisations who were involved in the drafting of it. It was very considered and measured uh, and informative for MSPs. But that report did find that by June this year, one in five cancer patients were not seen within the six-week target, a three-fold increase in just three years, Cabinet Secretary. The report concluded quite clearly that on diagnostics, Workforce issues seems to be the greatest concern uh, of impacting outcomes. And it said that ministers must take urgent and sustained action to address shortfalls in long-term workforce planning. So in addition to the comments made to my first answer, what action will the Cabinet Secretary take to ensure that radiology and oncology departments in Scotland are adequately staffed now, uh, not just in the future? And will she commit uh, to a date as to when we'll expect the government's six-week target to be met across all health boards. Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, well, just on the latter part, I'm sure if Mr Green cares to refresh his memory with the waiting times plan that I published about a year ago, he'll be able to see uh, when that date actually is because it's set out in great detail in that plan. In terms of uh, the report, the report has three key recommendations. I'd just like to update you briefly on those. Uh, develop a national model of workforce planning. I have made the commitment that our national workforce plan, in addition to the other workforce plans that we have already published, that the integrated national workforce plan will be published uh, before Christmas recess. Unlock the potential benefits of linked patient data. This is really a critical part of the report with which I couldn't agree more. It is, of course, easier to write than it is to do. These matters are complex, but I'm sure members will be pleased to know that we have almost reached an agreement on joint data controller and data sharing and deliver a step change in the provision of holistic cancer patient services. And of course, our joint £18 million in total work with Macmillan Cancer does precisely that in providing that holistic wraparound service. Final two points, presiding officer, if I may, I do think it's worth noting that our 31 uh, diagnosis to treatment target uh, has been met at 96.5%. That would be one and a half percent over the target in this quarter two, which was September 2019. So progress continues to be made and indeed on the 62 day target. And my final point is to uh, let the member know, I'm sure he'll be delighted by this, that in terms of medical trainee recruitment, uh, the stats for 2019, the final stats tell me that in clinical radiology, ST1 recruitment has a 100% fill rate. So progress is being made, presiding officer, more to do, but as you'll see, we are utterly committed to delivering that. Jamie Green. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary is right, there is more to do, there is much more to do as the statistics uh, show, and behind every statistic is a cancer patient who is waiting uh, to be diagnosed and to be treated, and that's the reality of the situation. Starting off, so the problem here is that consecutive uh, health secretaries have been repeatedly warned about these challenges over the years. As far back as 2015, the Royal College of Radiologists issued warnings about low uptake of radiology. In 2017, an Audit Scotland report flagged uh, similar workforce planning issues. And in 2018, a leading radiologist, Dr. Baxter Grant, warned that our services were on red alert. He went as far as saying that if we do not address these issues, there simply won't be a service in the next three, four or five years. So let me ask, why, after years of repeated warnings from health professionals right across the sector, has such little progress been made? And will she formally respond in writing to the recommendations in the cross-party group's report? Cabinet Secretary. So all I can say, presiding officer, is it's a good job that this government listens a lot better than Mr Green does. Yeah. I have answered all of those questions. Why do you think I gave you that factual information about what we've done since 2014, what we have done recently and the considerable progress that we made? And yes, you are absolutely right, Mr Green. Beside, uh, behind every one of those statistics is a cancer patient waiting uh, to be treated and cancer patients who are diagnosed. And I am more than you conscious of that. But I also know that behind all of those statistics are staff working hard every single day. Medical trainees, 100% fill rate in radiology. Those matters are important, they count, and progress has been made. And muttering at me from a sedentary position really won't take us much further. In terms of your final point, I will be delighted, and I know that the cross-party group know this, to respond in full uh, to their uh, report, which I've found very helpful, and to return to them, as I did in June, with a very constructive and helpful conversation that I've had with that cross-party group, and I look forward to doing that. There are three other <coughs> members who wish to ask supplementaries, and I'll start with our Keith Brown. Thank you, President Officer. As co-convener of the cross-party group on cancer, can I start by thanking all 67 respondents to the inquiry, be that be charities, researchers, patients, clinicians, or academics. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree that this was a constructive report uh, that is aimed to help and inform the government uh, rather than to purely challenge it. Uh, can I therefore ask whether she would uh, endorse all 10 recommendations made uh, in the report and specifically on the point around uh, vacancy rates uh, and indeed how that's impacting on diagnosis. Uh, this year there were 16,000 patients that waited more than the six week uh, time guarantee for their diagnostic test. That compares to just 4,000 patients three years ago. That's an exponential increase. What urgent action will the government take to look at not just recruitment, retention and training, but also how we use our technology and upskill existing clinicians also? Cabinet Secretary. 
<coughs> I'm grateful to Mr. Sawa for his question and indeed for his work in the cross-party group. I do completely agree that it is a very constructive and fair report and I'm very happy uh, here on the record to endorse all of the recommendations in that report and I look forward to the discussion that we'll have on that. Of course, we have invested in uh, capital uh, in terms of radiotherapy equipment and other uh, matters, 33 million uh, from our 100 million pounds cancer strategy going into radiotherapy, more money going into into scope capacity uh, and into surgical robots for prostate cancer plus others. So there's a capital issue, there's the training issue and the recruitment issue and the retention matters, but there is, as uh, Mr. Sarwar rightly says, also the question of redesigning uh, the service and the pathway so that we can upskill existing uh, clinicians and others to take on uh, new roles and we can look at how we streamline some of that work. My final point just on the streamlining is how we are, and we are doing this now, is looking at how we use the waiting times plan and the additional significant investment from that in order to group together our diagnostic capacity in certain areas so that we can speed up the time between di necessary diagnostic tests in order to detect particular kinds of cancer. And again, very happy to update the uh, uh, CPG on that matter in due course. Keith Brown to be followed by Neil Findlay. Uh, one of the issues uh, raised by the report is the ageing population and the very real need to expand our NHS workforce to meet that anticipated increase in demand. As the only population increase though in Scotland comes from inward migration, and given the complete lack of acknowledgement, far less concern regarding the impact of their support for Brexit from the Tory benches in this Parliament, what assurances has the UK Government given uh, that in the event of Brexit, Scotland will have the powers to deliver a tailored immigration system to ensure our NHS can recruit the specialists it needs long into the future? Slightly tangential, but if the Minister can briefly respond. Um, I'm grateful to the member for that question. He is right to talk about immigration policy in the context of the recruitment and retention of staff. We know uh, across our health service, you know, across these benches, everyone has been happy to laud the work that our colleagues from uh, the European Union mainland uh, bring uh, and do for us, the value of that and so on, as well as others from beyond these shores. But of course, if we do not control our own immigration policy and if we uh, are dragged out of the European Union against our clearly stated democratic will, then that increases the uh, workforce challenges that we have but additional challenges to presiding officer in terms of clinical research and advancement in medicines and technology. So uh, in answer to the member's question, the, the, the straightforward answer is of course, uh, the previous UK government, the one currently seeking re-election, uh, has made absolutely no recognition of the special uh, situation in Scotland. And indeed their proposition in particular on immigration, aside from being uh, quite shameful and inhumane, would cause significant damage uh, to the Scottish economy and to Scottish society as a whole. So I uh, absolutely endorse all calls, as I know increasingly across parties and across Scotland people do, that Scotland should have the right to choose its own immigration policy, as we should indeed have the right to choose much more about our future besides. And Neil Finlay. Um, staff shortages across the NHS are putting lives and patients' health at risk, especially cancer patients. But as I discovered last week, uh, through an FOI request, staff shortages in Lothian are resulting in them um, having to pay up to £1,715 a shift to private agencies to cover vacancies. Cabinet Secretary, NHS Lothian predicts a £90 million budget deficit. It's paying £1.4 million a month for a hospital with no patients. And now this. So what do you say to my constituents, can cancer patients and others, who are suffering because of the workforce crisis overseen by successive SNP ministers. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think I've already answered much of what Mr. Uh, Finlay says. The additional piece of information I'd give him, which was actually uh, uh, credit to his colleague, Mr. Sarwar, was the work that he and I were able to do in terms of the safe staffing legislation that looked at how we handled uh, agency spend inside boards and of course when that legislation uh, now have, having received royal assent uh, commences that will see uh, a significant shift 
uh, over time in how boards are able uh, to use agency spend as opposed to investing in recruitment of full-time employees. Uh, and that will make a significant difference, I believe, uh, to the work that's underway and to the overall uh, sustainability of our health service. Thank you. Question number three, Andy Whiteman. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what fire safety checks it has undertaken on the building cladding used in private student accommodation, including whether it has been checked for high pressure laminate cladding. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, given the events in Bolton at the weekend, I'm relieved that there was no loss of life, and I'd like to acknowledge the work of all of those uh, who brought that fire under control. Uh, student accommodation in, in Scotland is classed as relevant premises under the Fire Scotland Act 2005. This means that landlords as duty holders have responsibility uh, for fire safety risk assessments. Uh, my officials wrote in June this year to a range of bodies, including the Scottish Funding Council, representing the colleges and universities, to raise awareness of cladding tests being commissioned by the UK Government, which may prove useful as part of such risk assessments. Any significant fire in a residential building is, of course, a concern for all of us. Uh, Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service have stated that their investigation into the Bolton fire will consider the role of external cladding played in the development and spread of the fire. Once that information is available, uh, we will review any findings as part of our ongoing work on building and fire safety and will take any appropriate action necessary. Andy Whiteman. I thank the Minister for that um, answer. Um, as I said, the uh, fire brigade uh, uh, behaved, uh, operated exemplary in, in bringing that fire under control, but it was an incredibly scary uh, fire. Uh, the fire brigade also made clear in that instance that there was no ACM involved in that uh, building, but eyewitness observations of the fire uh, uh, said, quote, crawling up the cladding like it was nothing. And I think that exacerbates the fears of everyone building, living in such buildings. The minister mentioned fire risk safety assessments. Can you confirm to me whether these are uh, available to the residents of the buildings that have been assessed? Minister. Um, uh, President officer, uh, that uh, uh, particular aspect I cannot give an answer to directly to Mr. Whiteman at this moment in time. Uh, what I will do is I will write to him uh, and give him a comprehensive response on that point and let him know what actually happens uh, with those assessments. Andy Webb. I thank you. I think that would be extremely helpful because uh, I've been speaking to students and student bodies uh, who are extremely concerned as a consequence of the events in Bolton. Um, the, minister, the ministerial working group uh, indicated that there would be a creation of a public uh, a database to maintain safety critical information for existing high-rise residential buildings and in the minister's own evidence to the local government committee on the 5th of September 2018 he talked about an inventory. Can he update us where we are with that uh, inventory? And finally, what additional measures um, can the Scottish Government and its agencies put in place to with reassure residents, in particular students, that while, of course, fire is always a risk, that building materials will never exacerbate those risks? Yes. First of all, on uh, Mr Whiteman's point about student bodies, uh, student bodies have written to the Government recently on this point, um, and I will cooperate with uh, Ms Denham, the Community Safety Minister, uh, to ensure that they get answers to the questions that they have asked. Um, in terms of the inventory, um, the inventory uh, of high-rise domestic, uh, of high-rise buildings in Scotland um, is a piece of work which we have been uh, completing. Uh, the inventory is being developed to provide a central source of information and overview of the key aspects of high-rise domestic buildings in Scotland, including all of their fire safety features. And the inventory does ask for information on cladding types uh, including uh, uh, high pressure um, laminate, which has been uh, mentioned previously. Uh, we will continue as a government to review all of this. The ministerial working group is still meeting um, and we have discussed many, many matters. Um, and as and when um, more information and analysis comes to us, we will take the necessary steps to ensure that people are safe in buildings here in Scotland. Well, there are three members waiting patiently to ask questions. If they all ask a very brief question and a similarly, hopefully, a concise answer, we'll try and get through them. John Mason, followed by Sarah Boyack. Hey, thank you. I, just, I wonder if the Minister can offer any reassurance to constituents of mine who live in buildings with ACM cladding and are unable to sell them at the moment, as well as being very worried. 
Minister. Um, President officer, uh, I think that Mr. Um, uh, Mason uh, may be talking about folks who have cladding on their buildings which are not uh, made up of aluminium composite material and the current situation that there is and difficulty in uh, mortgage lending. I answered a question last week to Mr. Balfour um, around about this. Uh, the government is trying to seek solutions, uh, but mor mortgage lending is a reserved matter to the UK. Um, I've written twice now uh, to the UK Secretary of State, Mr. Jenrick, uh, to try and gain some cooperation around about this. I recognise uh, that there is a general election on the go at the moment, uh, but there is also still a day job to do. Um, my officials have also uh, been in discussions with UK Finance uh, and are having more meetings this week to try and reach resolution so that those folks who are finding difficulty in buying and selling their properties at this moment in time uh, can be helped. Uh, I do hope that the UK Government uh, will respond uh, to our request for help to find a solution. Senior Boyack to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Uh, what work has the Scottish Government done to assess whether local authorities have the staff and resources to ensure enforcement action can be taken where there are safety concerns from residents, whether they're students or general members of the public? Yes. Uh, President officer, I'm not aware uh, of any difficulties that local uh, authorities have had in responding to any request that the government has made um, in terms of, uh, uh, of the multitudes of requests that there have been since the tragedy at Grenfell. Um, I would like to thank very much all of the local authorities um, for their cooperation uh, in all that they have done uh, to the numerous questions that we have asked to ensure uh, that people in Scotland are safe. Uh, in particular, I, I'd like to thank them for their cooperation uh, in trying to put together the inventory of buildings, uh, which will be very helpful uh, in the future uh, and will require us uh, to ask less questions uh, because that inventory needs to be updated on a regular basis so we know what's going on in these buildings right across the country. Graham Simpson. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, in the light of Grenfell and the blaze in Bolton, does the Minister not agree with the Association of British Insurers that we must see a total ban on combustible materials being used on the outside of buildings? Yes. Um, Presiding Officer, uh, the Scottish Government, of course, had uh, an external independent panel of experts uh, looking at all of this. Uh, we will continue to take the advice uh, of that panel. I think the key thing in all of this is ensuring that the right testing uh, is done uh, to make sure that not only uh, do we have the right cladding and materials, but the fire stopping that is required in buildings is done properly um, in every single occasion. Um, we will continue to review everything as we move forward. We will continue to take the expert advice uh, that we have because our job is to ensure uh, that everyone is safe uh, in their buildings here in Scotland. Thank you very much, Minister and colleagues. We're going to move on. That concludes topical questions. We're going to move